Welcome, viewers, to Channel 17's Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, for our ongoing series, Focus. And today, viewers, let's welcome Janet Beale to the studio. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Margaret. It's a, thank you for inviting me. And it's wonderful to see you here, you are, Janet. You're, you're an artist, an author, a translator. And many other things. <laughs> but today, we're going to start off with you as the artist who did this mini comic called Sewer Destroyed. And we're going to, to see it with you. And uh, we'll, we'll just take it right now to, to show Sewer Destroyed, the, the walled city in Diyarbakir, Turkey. And you would like me to read the text out loud yes, while the pictures are shown? Yes, I would like you to do that. All please. right. Okay. All right. Diyarbakir, an ancient city, was first settled around 5000 BC, situated on caravan, caravan routes at the intersection of east and west in present-day southeastern Turkey. It was a regional capital under the Persian, Roman, Sasanian, Byzantine, and Islamic empires. The city's large black basalt walls enclosed the Sur district. For eight millennia, Sur has been inhabited uninterruptedly by heterogeneous peoples living alongside one another. It is an urban archaeological site, as well as a unique multilingual and multicultural city space. Its neighborhood culture relies on solidarity and a spirit of sharing, typified by the hammams, or public baths, like the Pasha Hammam, shown here. The Kursunlu Mosque is in the Fatih Pasha neighborhood, a mix of religious buildings, mosques, church, churches, and synagogues survived into the 21st century, including the largest Armenian Christian church in the Middle East. The minaret at the Sheikh Matar Mosque, built in 1500, stands on four legs that symbolically bring together four sects of Islam. Rural villagers brought traditional products to Sur, the region's commercial center, to trade while jewelry was forged in its lively neighborhoods, silk woven and copper worked. Kurds have lived in villages in Turkey's southeast from time immemorial. In the 1990s, the Turkish state destroyed many of those villages, just simply razed them to the ground. The residents fled to Diyarbakir, the largest city in the region. The Turkish Republic denies basic Kurdish human and cultural rights regarding even the concept of Kurdish as equivalent to terrorist. It has been a, at war with the Kurds for decades. In 2010, the mayor of Sur, Abdullah Demirbash, was criminalized for publishing city council information in Kurdish. The Kurdish freedom movement wants Kurds to be able to live in peace within Turkey's borders with local democratic self-administration but the state arrests even those who call for an end to the war, thousands between 2009 and 2012 alone. In June and November 2015 nationwide elections, the pro-peace, pro-Kurdish HDP party, that's the third largest party in Turkey, did better than the ruling AKP party of er Recep Tayyip Erdogan would have preferred. That is, they exceeded the 10% hurdle, a very high electoral hurdle for representation in the Turkish parliament. They got 13% of the vote. It was, and and this, was, this was unacceptable to Erdogan. On September 6th, the, Kurdish, the Turkish state declared curfews in six neighborhoods of Sur. Turkish armored vehicles came into the neighborhood. Security forces enforced the curfew. No one could step outside their home on pain of being shot by snipers. Medical care was disrupted. No schools took place. Let me just say something here. The word curfew is used misleadingly by the Turkish state. You, in, in other places when a curfew is imposed, it's say maybe when a criminal is at large or something, or it's for the protection, it's, or it's said to be for the protection of people who are living in a neighborhood. This curfew, the curfews as imposed by the Turkish state were more like a state of siege, in which actually it's the residents of the neighborhood who are the enemy. 
and, and, and it's, a, it's in effect an attack on the residents rather than an, an, an effort to protect the residents from an external force. They are the external threat. The Turkish special forces were the external threat. Food and water shortages soon developed. Police raided houses. Smoke rose over homes being destroyed. A second curfew was declared for September 13th to 14th and a third for October 10th to 13th. Security forces opened fire on those who tried to step outside their homes. No one could go outside to see what was happening. Curfew 4 ran from November 28th to 30th. Snipers killed dozens of citizens who risked venturing outside. The sounds of helicopters were heard. Back in August and September, while the threat was still looming, PKK youth in Sur had dug trenches and installed barricades in case Turkish security forces moved against them. The Democratic Neighborhood People's Councils of Sur and other places had declared autonomy, meaning local self-administration. I'll have to explain, explain that also. In the, Turkish, the Turkish state is extremely centralized. It's a monolith from the center in Ankara down to the neighborhood level. It's, it's not a federal system where there's different levels of government have different powers as in the United States or in Germany. It's a very centralized monolith. The Kurds were basically asking for local self-administration, much like our American city, city councils. In October, the Lalabi neighborhood became the scene of intense police violence as youth attempted to defend the neighborhood from behind paltry defenses. During curfew five, December 2nd through 10th, much of Sur was under lockdown. Amnesty International called it a collective punishment. Others noted a general atmosphere of lawlessness. The police feel they have the backing of the government, that they are untouchable, as the Guardian reported on March 3rd. Human rights groups asked Turkish authorities to suspend the curfew for several hours to allow a humanitarian corridor so civilians inside the embattled areas could leave. On December 10th, police used loudspeakers to demand that everyone still left amid the ruined buildings surrender. The provincial governor said, if there are terrorists among those who wish to come out, they should come out and we will hand them over to the law, unquote. Some refused. My brothers are afraid to come out, said Mehmet Karate, in his, a man in his late 40s. They don't trust the police not to kill them. Why should they surrender? They're civilians. Their houses are here. The sixth and last curfew started on December 11th, 2015, a continuous curfew in the six neighborhoods. Civilians trapped in ruined buildings could only hear the roar of heavy artillery, tanks, and machine gun fire echoing through, echoing through the streets. Hidden from their sight, Turkish military and police used heavy weapons against the rebels, often young people, tra transforming much of Sur into a war zone. Many residents fled even the intact parts of Sur. In 2015, Sur's population had been 50,000. With the curfews, tens of thousands people became refugees in their own city with no shelter. By March 3rd, about 19% of all buildings inside the curfew the sewer curfew zone had been destroyed. Ruins piled atop ruins, rubble on rubble. Heavy equipment and bulldozers demolished the areas under curfew and systematically destroyed even buildings that had not been damaged. Relatives of those killed in the conflict clutched pictures of disappeared loved ones, asking the Turkish state to give back the bodies of those killed in the fighting. The Pasha Hammam that that hammam or bath that we saw earlier on was par partly destroyed. Parts of the Kursunlu Mosque were ruined beyond repair. Two of that, mi that four-legged minarets, four legs, symbolizing tolerance, were damaged. Churches were destroyed. A road for military transport was carved out adjacent to the Armenian church, that largest Armenian church in the Middle East. The ancient street pattern has been disrupted as entire blocks of buildings were obliter obliterated and roads were broadened to accommodate tanks. Millennia of urban memory have been eradicated. Says former Sur resident Erjan Eboya, the authentic historical fabric of almost half of the old city of Diyarbakir has been lost forever. Schools have been repurposed as military posts. On the black basalt walls, military equipment has been installed in order to be able to shoot into Sur. 
let me add one thing that I didn't have a have the opportunity to 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 complete this because um, the sir, the Global Action Day to protesting the destruction of Sir was April 28th. But the the next shoe to drop is that this, the Turkish state expropriated um, the 82 percent of the property in Sir that it didn't own already. It already owned like 18 percent of it. But it once the people were driven out, which was the ultimate purpose of the destruction, it simply seized control of their buildings. And what they're now doing, having leveled half of the, the, all the buildings that I talked about, like some six, 1,600 buildings, they're building condos. The idea is to bring in people from, uh, from people, Turkish nationalists, people from other parts of Turkey to live there, people who are not Kurds and who won't pose a, pose a challenge, such, such by, pose challenges to the Turkish state by doing irritating things like asking for basic human rights and basic human and cultural rights. So they're building condos and instead of, and instead of following the old, uh, the old street layout, they're going just, just ignoring that and building, using new street layouts and they're using um, concrete for the, a building a material that had nothing to do with the ancient fabrics, but they're using concrete covered with a, a veneer of black basalt in order to, in order to uh, yeah, replicate the authentic basalt that was destroyed. Um, and yeah, the, the, and of course the, um, the, um, these new condos that are being built are far too expensive for the old residents, the former residents of, of Diyarbakir to, uh, and of Sur to, to purchase. They are, they are, yeah, they have just gone elsewhere. Yeah, where, where are the, the people who have been displaced? They've gone to, they've gone to stay with friends, relatives. It's, it's, they have nothing. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, a lot of these residents of Sura originally came from villages nearby that the Turkish state had destroyed in fighting the PKK in the 1990s. And so they flooded into Sura, the, the, this, this old neighborhood in the biggest city. And now, you know, now they've been driven out of Sura. So for the second time, they've been displaced. Probably a lot of them go to Ankara, go to, or not to Ankara, go to Istanbul, where there's also a very large Kurdish population there now. Again, mostly the refugees um, from earlier persecutions. Um, that would be, my guess would be that they've, that they've gone into other big cities of Turkey where they, yeah, face, face uh, extreme pressure to assimilate. And Janet, you, you drew this this passionate story that you presented to us now, after you had been to a Paris conference, could you tell us something about that? Okay, um, this, there was a, um, a tribunal in Paris in, in, mid, the, in mid March called the Permanent People's Tribunal on Turkey and the Kurds. This is um, um, a, a series; it's part of a series of tribunals on different um, the issues of different peoples, not individuals, but peoples who can't get who have no recourse to justice in their home countries. So it's a non-governmental um, um, tribunal. In the past, they've, they've um, um, prosecuted cases for the Rohingya, for example. It goes back to the Vietnam War, actually, and comes out of Bertrand Russell. I think there was a Bertrand Russell tribunal of some kind. It evolved out of that. Um, in any case, so this, this March, they were uh, addressing the case of, of Turkey's treatment of the Kurds, and Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president, and his AKP ruling party would like us all to think that um, anyone who even mentions the word Kurd is a terrorist, because that implies separation. He throws this word terrorist around all the time, and it's been very effective. Um, and, that the, and that these kinds of incursions um, into the Kurdish areas are basically police actions against criminals who are trying to break up the Turkish state. What this tribunal, what the prosecution in the Paris tribunal was arguing is that these are not police actions against criminals. This is a, an armed conflict. It is a civil war, an actual war between the Turkish armed forces and, and the PKK. And it's, it's necessary to, to define it properly that way. Um, and and in, in order to, in order to, for to even t so that the world can even see that and, and get past this prejudice that the that the Turkish state has tried to um, tried to impose on this situation, you know, um, 
in the Turkish constitution, everyone who lives in, who is a citizen of Turkey must be a Turk, an ethnic Turk, period. Anatolia is actually a very, heter a very heterogeneous place ethnically. There have been not just Kurds are now the largest ethnic group, but there are, maybe you know that there were once a lot of Armenians in Turkey. There were a lot of Greeks. Um, there was the Greek Orthodox, or, or Istanbul used to be the, the, basically the, 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 the center, the patriarchate of the Greek Orthodox Church. There are very few Greek Orthodox churches, if any, in Istanbul now, or in, or in Turkey, that's been, that's been homogenized. So, if, so you, by definitionally, a Turkish citizen is, must be an ethnic Turk. Kurds have, of course, been, obje have been objecting to this for so ever since that situation was created in 1923. There have been rebellions. Kurds have been defined as mountain Turks. <laughs> um, there have been rebellions. There have been, in 1934, the Turkish state passed something called the Law of Resettlement that basically allowed it to carry out forced collective resettlements. And like, very much like the one that we just, we just saw in, in Seur uh, in 2015, 2016, but it has been doing this for a long time. Um, it, was, it, it started in 19, soon after this law was passed in 1934, um, they, it tried to carry out a large resettlement in the Kurdish city of Dersim, renaming it Tunceli. Um, it, and, and, even, uh, and up until just a few months ago, there's another such resettlement by the Turkish state that has taken place, this time not even within the boundaries of Turkey itself, but in a place called Afrin. Um, it's across the border in Syria. Uh, it's a canton of the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, um, a democratic place um, populated largely but not solely by Kurds. Um, in, it, it's, um, Afrin is part of what has become popularly known as Rojava, um, but it's been, the name has been changed from Rojava to the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria because Rojava is a Kurdish word, a Kurdish name, and the system is ethnically inclusive. In stark contrast to the enforced homogeneity of Turkey, as, of the Turkish Republic, as defined by its constitution, in Afrin and the other parts of this new system in, in Northern Syria, um, its constitution starts out by saying, we are home to Kurds, Turk, Kurds, Turkmens, Arameans, Assyrians, Arabs, Circassians, Chechens, and there's a long list of peoples who live there, and everybody has a right to be here. They're trying to create, they're trying to model an ethnically and religiously inclusive way of, of, for, that people can coexist in the Middle East. And women also, have, there, have, have rights in this place. It's, it's a gender equal place, unlike the Turkey under the AKP, which is trying to reinforce the old traditional gender system of, of Turkey using honor killings and polygamy and, and um, enforced child marriage and all of those things that, that, make, that, that just make it impossible for women to fulfill any of their potentialities apart from child rearing. So, as I'm saying, as I said, in, in Janu on January 20th of this year, the Turkish, Turkish armed forces, assisted by mercenaries of, of jihadist, basic jihadist mercenaries, um, invaded their peaceful neighbor, Afrin. And after, you know, this is the second largest army in NATO. And the Afrin defended only with light weapons. And so it was overrun very quickly. And now you're seeing the same kind of resettlement carried out. They're, they're, they've destroyed buildings, and they're expelling the Kurdish population. They've had to flee, basically flee for their lives. Um, some of them are living out in, the, out in fields now, in, in open fields. They're part, sleeping, sleeping in cars. Um, so, um, and and the, the, the Turkish state is has done this with complete impunity. You know, when Vladimir Putin invaded, um, just grabbed Crimea a few years ago, there was, the world was outraged and sanctions were imposed. And also he's messing around with Ukraine and stirring up pro-Russian, trying to throw up, stir up pro-Russian sympathy there so that he could, had, he has his designs on Ukraine. Um, the world is outraged. 
of this is what has happened with the Turkey. What Turkey has done in Afrin is very, very similar. It just grabbed the territory of a peaceful neighbor and claimed it as its own. And, but in this case, in the case of Turkey, it's do, taking this additional step of resettling populations. It's, 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 you know, another word for it is ethnic cleansing, I guess. But it goes back to that, that 1934 law that I mentioned, the law of resettlement that they, that they use to try to, to, try to uh, create facts on the ground and eliminate, and eliminate all effort, uh, try, to, try to cow the Kurds into, into giving up any prospect that, they'll ever, that their people will ever have human and cultural rights. And Janet, you are a witness of this as you were at the conference, right? Yes. And so you sat there and you did, you, you started your illustrations then, or you were listening yes. and watching? Um, the, I was listening and watching. I was, there was an international observer and the, um, uh, my, my friend Erjan Eboya, who I quote in here, gave a presentation on the destruction of Sur. And then he told me afterwards that they were do, going to do have a day of action and I thought, I came home and I thought, this is what I will, this is what I'll do. I'll write this mini comic for it. And um, so I posted it on social media and it's going to be published in a, in a Middle Eastern Studies periodical with an Arabic name. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it, but someone will, it's going to be published in a magazine. So and uh, could, could you mention, Janet, the, uh, the name of the other city that is mentioned on the Global Day of Action? It begins with an H. Yes. Hassan Kif is, is, is a town very near Diyarbakir. Mm -hmm. On the Tigris River, it too has been s settled from time immemorial, um, and the the um, the threat to Hassan Kif is a is a giant dam project. Um, there's a lot of a lot of water resources in Turkey. Um, the, the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are in, are in Turkey, especially in the Kurdish areas, and it's a means that they're, they've been trying to build large dams in the in the rural southeast in order to power the industrial development of Turkey, especially in the west, and also as a way of population control, as a way, and as it's also part of the war against, against uh, you know, Kurdish rights. Um, so they are, this is, this Hasan Kif has, is, um, you know, there, there are these beautiful, if you, if it's H-A-S-A-N-K-E-Y-F. If you Google that, you'll see these but by the river, there are these gi these giant caves where people have been living for for ages, and um, it's a it's also an ecological ecological a very sensitive ecological site. Um, it's all going to be flooded by this Ilusu Dam that the Turkish state is like it, it's about ninety five percent finished now. It's my friend Erjan has been fighting it for years, um, but it seems like it's it's uh, very close to being to being finished. And when, once that happens, um, part of our world heritage, part of, I mean, this, this goes back to the earliest days of human civilization, at least in this part of the world, um, will be flooded and lost forever. Um, and thousands of villagers, many of them Kurdish, will once again be displaced. Um, and and uh, so, so the idea of this action day was to twin this, this, this day, the, this, the, dis the uh, destruction of Sur with the, Im the looming destruction of this site, ancient archaeological site, right nearby. And what are, what are the peacekeeping agencies, the, like the UN or other agencies that have some oversight over what's mm -hmm. happening? Well, UNESCO has declared, it had declared parts of Sur, a, um, those basalt walls, a world heritage site. That means there's, you have to meet like 10 criteria to, to, be, to qualify as a world heritage site. That means it should, have, it should be respected and protected. But um, Turkey just ignored that. Um, the, the, the opponents of the dam in Hasan Kif have been trying for years and years and years to get world heritage status for Hasan Kif, and they got nine out of, they met, met nine out of 10 criteria officially, although there's no question it should be regarded as a world heritage site. Um, but the, tur the turkey just ignores that. They don't care. They just, they're, they, um, yeah. Um, they don't, they, they, they don't care what the UN says. They, they, you know, Turkey acts like it has a blank check, like it has a, a free pass to do so many things because it is in NATO. It's, um, our, it's the ally, it's an ally of all the NATO countries and, 
and it it uh, it, it goes on a lot of the the really evil things that this state has done, and it's getting more and more evil um, under Recep Tayyip Erdogan, becoming a fascistic place. Um, it gets away with it because you know of our of our base at Interlik, and we have nuclear weapons at the base in Interlik. Um, um, Turkey is regarded as as a as an essential ally in NATO. I think if NATO were formed today, uh, Turkey would not be included in it because it, NATO, at least ostensibly, is is supposed to consist of countries that have democratic values. But uh, yeah, democratic values are now few and far between in in Turkey. And what was the main objective of the Paris conference? The the objective of the Paris conference was to basically hear the hear the complaints of of the Kurdish people over just the past couple of years. Like I said, the fight is they've been at odds for decades, but you can't it's just it that evidence would be too overwhelming to present. So they just decided to limit themselves to just the past two years, including things like, you know, the destruction of Sur. Um, and and the Turkish state was invited to send their own lawyers to mount a defense, to defend their actions. Time was given for them, allocated for them in this tribunal, but of course they didn't show up. Nobody from the Turkish state showed up. And the judges are based, were about seven or eight human rights lawyers, um, justices, uh, human rights professors, experts on international law. Um, they, they're not particular to this case. They hear all the cases. Um, but so they heard um, the prosecution. Um, uh, provide evidence of of the uh, um, of these atrocities, war crimes committed in the in in the war against the Kurds. Um, witnesses were brought in. For example, um, my, my friend Erjan was brought in to testify um, about the destruction of Sur. There were other other uh, at war crimes committed dur around the same time. Sur was not the only one. Um, most notoriously, in a city called Chizre, a small mostly Kurdish city in the southeast. Um, rather, there was, a, um, uh, they, there was a heavy use of snipers um, and destruction of buildings. People who were residents of the buildings, you know, first the, the, the top floor would be blown away by tanks, then the middle floors, and the people would flee down to the next level until finally they were in their basements, hiding, waiting for the tanks to go away. In three, three basements, they were burned alive by, by Turkish special forces. It's like about, about 150 people, I think. Burned alive. Um, and so one of the, at the it, it, it's unspeakable. So one of the witnesses for the prosecution in this tribunal was the man who went down into one of the basements and first discovered um, the burnt bodies. And, he, and he, he explained to the justices what he saw. Um, so there were, yeah, so there was a lot, they, there were a lot of witnesses testifying. And um, the, the verdict is to be announced on May 24th, which is very soon, maybe by the time this is broadcast. Uh, un I'm, unfortunately, I'm not able to go to Brussels to hear the, to hear the, the verdict. I wish I could, but um, yeah. Well, we and once, the, once, but once this, this message is out, once a verdict is out, that's just another a, a resource that the Kurds can use to try to, to try to break through the silence about their persecution. And they, you know, and through this, this silence enforced by the fact of Turkey's NATO membership, and also, to be honest, by the the great fear of of um, of um, refugees. Um, by European governments, you know they're very they're very frightened that if they let a lot of refugees in into Germany and into France, you know, um, they they could they they could fall from power. People will be very upset, and so they've essentially paid Turkey to keep the re keep those people there so that they won't come into Europe. And so it's it's a kind of a devil's bargain that they've made with Erdogan. Um, he'll he he takes their money from them and keeps refugees in Turkey and camps or whatever, I don't know what he does. So, so um, um, par also partly because of that, the fear of, fear of immigration, immigrants from the Middle East, Turkey has leverage. Part of the aim of the tri things, this tribunal and other, you know, global action days and other things that 
activists do, in the, especially in the Kurdish diaspora in Europe, is to try to break through that, that silence and, and protest essentially the devil's bargain that's been made by NATO with Turkey and by, and by, by European governments and also by the American government with um, Turkey to, to keep refugees out of, out of those countries. So, yeah. Thank you, Janet. You are a witness to this, and with your with your many comic also, which we will we will display and we will continue Thank to you. to publicize. Thank and you. before you go, could you please talk about this book that you have translated? It is the uh, if you would just take it yes. and uh, talk about it. Um, this is I've translated this book from German. It's called Sarah. My whole life was a struggle. The author is Sakine Jansis. Sakina Jansis, it's the first of three volumes. It's her autobiography, it's a memoir. Um, Sakina Jansis was one of the co-founders, was a co-founder of the PKK in 1978. She was one of only two women to be at the founding Congress. Um, she's a very, very important leader in the Kurdish freedom movement. She spent, I think, 10, 11 years in a Turkish prison, mostly in the 1980s. And when she was released, she was, was um, participated in the fighting uh, in the Kandil Mountains um, of northern Iraq, um, where the PKK is based. Um, this is she's become essentially the godmother of the very strong Kurdish women's movement. Um, um, maybe you've seen in news reports about fighting against ISIS, the young Kurdish women fighting with AK-47s against Daesh. She, she is. The, the inspiration for a lot of them. Um, so she's a very important figure in, in the history of women in revolution. She was assassinated in Paris in 2013 by uh, agents of Turkish intelligence, MEET. Um, and no justice has been done for her murder, um, again, because of this devil's bargain, this, in that case between France and the Turkish state. So. Um, but in, in uh, the mid-1990s, during those long, long winters in the mountains, she had a manual typewriter, and she typed out her autobiography in Turkish, and um, carried it, she and her friends carried it in their backpacks through the defiles of the Kandil Mountains, and somehow it ended up being published in Turkish. Um, I don't understand, I'm not, I'm not, I guess probably by a Kurdish house, I'm not sure. And then it was published in German. And when I was at a conference in Hamburg in 2015, the, 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 the German translator, who was a friend of mine, was putting out copies on the table of volume one. And I said, oh, where's the English version? She said, doesn't exist. So I picked up a copy. And as I was reading it, I realized this has to be in English. This woman is too important. She's really a legend in the Kurdish movement. And um, I'll just. If no one else is translating it, then I'll just have to do that. So I've been worked, it took me a couple of years because I do it in my spare time. And I'm now hard at work on volume two and volume three lies ahead. So this will keep me busy for a while. But I'm very honored to be able to, to translate her work and bring it to English, English readers. Oh, so. thank you very much, Janet. And here's the picture of this the woman, Sakin Kansis. Sakin Ajansis. Published, yeah. it's available from Pluto Press. Yeah. Um, published just last month. So. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and, and uh, have a good voyage now. You're going somewhat on a book launch, right, and to, yes. to Europe? And, uh, I'm going to the UK, which there's a lot of um, Kurdish dias diaspora Kurds who live in, in London and other, other parts of the British Isles. So uh, yeah, so I'll be speaking in a few places in the UK at the end of the month, mm. so doing book launches. So. Well, Janet, it's an honor to have you here, and I, I, am, I admire your work so much, and I'm so, so glad that our viewers had a chance to see some of your work here, and I'm incredibly moved by oh. your, your story, Sur Destroyed. Thank you so much for being my guest, and uh, come back again. You have more stories to tell. More, more, you're, you're such a stellar witness of, of what is going on. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for helping to break the silence, Margaret. Thank you for doing that work. Okay. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. See you again. Okay. Goodbye, viewers. Thank you for watching.